Blessings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm Pastor Rob Johnson, thanking you once again for checking out our YouTube channel, our Facebook page. Uh, on our YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button and, and you'll be prompted when messages come available. Uh, share messages, whatever you can do. Share the word, use your social media, your Facebook accounts to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let his light be reflected off of you through your social media accounts. It's a great way, and I know the Lord will bless you for it. Sometimes we go through seasons in our life where we are unfruitful spiritually. And the Holy Spirit, if we have a prayer life and we have a relationship with God, the Bible promises us that we've been given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will reveal to every one of us the areas of our life that are not being fruitful, producing the spiritual fruit of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we need to let God dig below the surface into our root system to find out why we're not producing fruit. Jesus spoke of this powerfully in a parable because he saw the church, God's people of that day, he saw that they had become an unfruitful pe people. On the outside, on the surface, they were a well-oiled machine, but underneath the surface at the root system, they were barren and they had stopped producing fruit like love, forgiveness, and a true relationship with God. So grab your Bible as we dig into the word, Call up a friend. You guys share this together and then talk about it. I want to give you a homework assignment for the first time. And it's not included in the scriptures that we read today in the message. But it's, a, it's the lemon next to the pie. Go home and read James chapter 1 after you listen to this message. And God will bless you. I hope you enjoy it. I hope the Lord blesses you. Pray before you, you delve into the word and may God richly bless your life. I love you all. Thank you. God bless. There's a lot of people who have been in the church their, their whole life or most of their life. But unfortunately, when the Bible says we're born again as Christians, when we're born again, the Bible likens it as to a baby being born. We're on pablum and milk and then and then soft foods, and then meats, and stuff like that. So there's a progression of growth that should be in the life of every single believer. And there's a lot of people who've been coming to church for decades. But unfortunately, they're spiritual toddlers. In the way that an athlete works out his muscles or her muscles. An athlete goes to the gym. They got a game coming up. They know that the opponent that they're facing in that game or that tournament or whatever, they know that, that the main objective for that team is to beat them. So they want to go to the gym. They want to work out so they can become physically fit to be able to go in and do battle on the court or on the field. And it's the same with you and I as believers. We need to work out our spiritual muscle starting with faith. Because Jesus corrected the disciples when they said, give us that kind of faith, Lord. Give us that amount of faith. And Jesus said, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could command this tree to be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Jesus was telling them that Mustard seed faith is all we will ever need because it's a power source that comes from God. It doesn't come from religion. It doesn't come from church membership. It comes from having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. So you and I as believers, when we come to church and we worship together and we fellowship and we read our Bibles and we have a prayer life and we, we share the gospel, all these things, we are exercising our muscle of faith because hear this, our faith, the level of our faith is the amount, the level of our belief in God. 
So if you have faith in some areas of your life, and it's, and it's a big faith, but other areas you know that not so much. Whatever area that our faith needs to be put into work, whatever area that is, the amount of faith we have in that trial, in that moment, is the amount that we, of our heart that we truly believe that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. So we never have a problem with faith. In reality, it's a problem with belief and trust, as my sister so aptly said. Our faith is tied to how much we believe in God. And in today's world, we see a lot of, I call them man boys. There's a lot of young men that play video games through junior high and high school and ride skateboards and they sit around the house and, and then they carry that on into their 20s and even in their 30s. They're not being men. They're not being ladies of God. They're being man boys and young girls. There's women who are 30 something years old that are still acting like junior high school kids. There's men out there that are in their 30s that are still acting like they're 14, 15 years old. This is a problem in today's world, just from a literal standpoint. And it's certainly true in the spiritual lives of Christians. But we get to choose. We decide how much we're going to believe in God. We decide how powerful our witness is going to be. God gives us the ability to choose, and he gives us the freedom to choose. Last week, we had a situation here that was unfortunate. But when you pare it all down, it was a situation that was of a, of a spiritual Nature, nature, not a physical crisis. It's a spiritual problem. And we need to lift the one who's suffering up to the Lord in prayer. And we need to love on that person and pray for that person because there's a, there is a spiritual crossroads that's taking place right now in that person's life. And we're going to be faced with similar situations, crises, whatever type of crisis it is. There's, going to, there's a million different types of crises and trials that we can go through. And you and I as believers are going to face them. And we get to decide the outcome. I'm going to say this about three times through the message. Write down. I'm not going to refer to it today or, or read it. But write James chapter 1 down and go home and make that your Bible study this week. James chapter 1. Because it talks about how to deal with trials in times of crisis. And what, how faith plays into that. So it's a powerful personal Bible study. The first chapter of James. Because in our spiritual life, we need to be growing. We need to evaluate ourselves, every one of us, and say, spiritually, I know I'm 58 years old. Spiritually, where are, where are you, Rob? Are you still a spiritual adolescent? We need to evaluate ourselves and find out what our spiritual age is, and be honest with ourselves. Because when we do, and then we lay it on the altar through prayer, God will deal with us accordingly, and we can grow really fast. Because at this time in history, God needs warriors on the battlefield. He doesn't need squatters in churches. He doesn't need rear ends in the seats. It's not about having 20 million Christians on earth. It's about having 
a few Christians, maybe even the vast minority of all the body of Christ, but God needs warriors, spiritual warriors in the world today doing battle and pouring it forward into the generations to come. Because when we compromise in our lives, our kids and young people see it. That's why I address the young people today. They may not ever say anything, but they're watching us. There's unbelievers that are watching us, and we have the opportunity to be a witness. Because spiritually, think about it like this. The football teams, or whatever team that I was talking about in the beginning, you're going to play this team, you study their moves, you know their patterns, and you see how strong that team is, and you go to the gym, and you work out, and you get on the practice field with your coach, and you work out plays, and you try and play your hardest, and do your best. That is just for a simple football game or baseball game. But the truth is, this is what God wants of you and I as believers. We know what the enemy's tricks are. He's only got a few of them. We've been watching them since the Garden of Eden. So we need to be for every, when we look at the world today and we see, oh, how far it's coming like it was in the days of Noah and, and there's a demonic force through people are angry and, and yelling and burning and setting fires. There's an anger like I haven't seen ever in my lifetime. It's a demonic force. This is the enemy that we're sending those children to fight 10 years from now. Moms and dads, how are you as a coach? We can all ask ourselves, how am I as a believer? Because we need to be stronger spiritually than the enemy that we fight in order to win. Amen? So spiritual growth is so important. That's what God's put on my heart to talk about today because it gets put on the back burner because we put so much emphasis on salvation. Now that somebody's saved, great. Let's go out and get somebody else saved. But there's evangelism and then there's discipleship. That's the growing part. And God has called us all to examine ourselves. Our first scripture is going to be Hebrews 12, 15. Before we read it, let's pray. Father, I love you so much. God, I give you my heart, my life, my mind, my countenance. I pray, O oh Lord, that, that Monday through Saturday, that your spirit so shines and reflects your light through my life, that without saying a word, that I could lead somebody to you. Lord, there's people among us today, the majority of folks sitting in here today are dealing with major trials in their lives, major spiritual battles that are masking themselves in legal problems or problems that of the world. They're disguised as, as other things, but in reality, at the core, at the root, they're spiritual issues. So teach us through your word today what we can do to grow into the people, the person that you have created us to be as an individual first and then collectively as the body, as your church. Speak to every heart here. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Okay, let's read. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Wait. Is that right? That none, none of you, none of you look after each other so that none. Oh, 
not just the people that we think deserve it, not just the people that don't come against us, Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Even our enemies, even the people that stand on soapboxes and scream to the top of their lungs, everything that you disdain. I'll say even those, but I'll, I'll go a step farther because Jesus said, especially those. So that none of you fails to receive the grace of, of God. Woo! Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. If you know the root system in vineyards or orchards or forests, a bad root on one tree can wrap itself around on the trees around it and bring them all down. But we being the body of Christ, I've shared many times, we need to have the root system like the giant redwoods because the giant redwoods roots go, don't go down very deep, but they spread out and they wrap themselves around all of the giant redwoods around them. And even in the forest today, there's trees that are 300 years old that have been dead for 100 years, but they're still standing because those around them won't let them go. This is who we need to be in Christ. We need to not pass people off. Oh, they got an alcohol or a drug problem or, or they do this or they do that. We need to reach out and embrace our brothers and sisters and say, man, I can feel it. What can I do? Can I pray with you? Let's pray together right now. Because every believer gets to choose whether or not we're going to allow the trials in our life to strengthen the good roots that God has grown within our hearts. Good roots that, that will feed us and produce good fruit in our life. Or we can allow situations, circumstances, trials, tribulations, whatever. We can allow those things to create and feed a root of bitterness. And a root of bitterness, when you get a bad root, a wild root, that root of bitterness in your heart can grow down and you can become spiritually root bound because that root of bitterness will wrap itself around all of the good roots in your life. And it'll stunt your spiritual growth or even halt your spiritual fruit production. We get to choose. Yes, Lord? <laughs> what, what was that? Hello? I think we got it. You, can you hear me now? I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm preaching it, Lord. I, I promise I'm preaching it. We got to make sure we don't become root bound. Don't let a root of bitterness grow around, wrap us around, wrap around the good roots and stop our fruit production. And I've learned in my life that in all things, in every area of my life as a Christian, I have got to yield myself, my anger, my thoughts, my offense, my ins being insulted. I got to yield everything to the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit of God will begin to strengthen the roots in my life. If I don't allow that root of bitterness to grow, the Holy Spirit will, will, will strengthen my root system and reveal to me the truth of what this trial is bringing. I've been through trials in my life where I didn't know why and I, I, I cried out literally, why are you letting us go through this, God? And, and the Holy Spirit through prayer, it took getting in that quiet place and standing still and letting God move. But through prayer, God revealed to me what was really going on because at the core of every single trial, physical, literal situation that we go through, there's a spiritual lesson to be learned in everything that we do. And God wants us to let him feed us through his root system and not allow trials, 
to feed that root of bitterness that will choke out what God's doing in our life and produce fruit. So let's see what the Bible says about how we can deal with trials and disappointment. And I'm telling you, from the Word of God, the goal is never to eliminate trials or disappointment. Because Jesus Himself, out of all the things, Jesus raised the dead. Jesus healed the blind. Jesus conquered, got the keys to hell, death, and the grave. Jesus rose from the dead. And Jesus said, it's impossible that offenses won't come. So we know they're coming. So the goal is not to eliminate them. The goal is to learn how we can deal with them and deal with disappointment and all that kind of stuff so God can use those things to help us grow spiritually. And you know what? There's times in our life, speaking from experience, where God is going to have to let your dream, your ideas, your plans... God's going to have to let those things die so that his plan and purpose for your life can come into fruition. Luke 13, Jesus gives a parable to describe God's di disappointment with what was happening in the religious system at that time. God's disappointment in what the religious system had become in Jesus' day when Jesus was here and ministering on the earth. How man made rules and man's ideas and man's messages and man's plans had taken over God's people. And it took the re those things took the, re the place of having a true relationship with God. And Jesus breaks it for, down for him in this parable. Let's, let's look at Luke 13. Let's read 6 through 9. So he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And when he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Let's stop here for a second. Have you ever gone to a place or an area of your life that should be producing and you expected it to be producing? And you go to reach out what you, what you expected that, and take the fruit that you expected to be there and found none? Have you ever invested in, in something and, and you went out to, to you, you reached out to, to take the, the, the bounty and the fruit from that invested and found there was nothing there? at all. You found it completely fruitless. It's like putting two dollars in a vending machine at the hospital, pushing the button, and nothing comes out. So you grab hold of the vending machine and you shake it until Nurse Ratchet comes down and says, Pastor Rob, you're going to have to leave uh, if you keep shaking that vending machine. No, I'm kidding. But it's the truth. It's like that. That's what Jesus is saying in this parable. This is what it was like for God. God in this, in this parable that he's using, the, the vineyard owner reaches out. He goes out into his orchard and he looks at a tree and he, he goes to, to take the fruit from what should be on that tree and he finds none. Jesus is trying to self, help us see this is, this is how the, the vineyard owner felt. Let's read on. Verses 7 through 9 says, Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, who said, the vineyard owner, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he, meaning the vineyard worker, answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Notice how this parable parallels Jesus' ministry. For three years, Jesus had come seeking fruit from God's people, from the church, for lack of a better word, and found none. And he's so, Jesus is challenging the, the religious system that at that time that had become so rooted in self-reliance and self-serving religion. It becomes so rooted and grounded in those things of man that spiritually it was a fruitless church. They were a fruitless 
people failing to produce any of the fruit, things like healing and, and true love and compassion and, and true repentance. So Jesus is, is challenging it and threatening to uproot it. And this parable is also for us today, as is everything in Scripture. And it tells us uh, what we're supposed to do when in seasons of our life, when we get to seasons or areas of, of our life and we find out that we're fruitless, seasons of disappointment, seasons of, of frustration. And, and this pi pi parable is painting a picture for us. We can picture a bunch of trees in this orchard. We can see the vineyard orchard out there and the vineyard worker and the, and the owner is watching and he's walking around investigating his, his trees, his vineyard. And, and he sees that this one, this one tree isn't producing the fruit that it's supposed to be producing. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. So for you and I, when we look around in areas of our life and we look at areas that we know in our hearts that we should be producing spiritual fruit and we're not, that's why this, this parable is so for us today because the tendency for a lot of people today when, when we find that there's areas of our Christian life that is not bearing fruit is to, to try to find something to blame it on. So we'll blame the ground. If we feel that we're, that we, if we know in our hearts that there's a standard that we need to be meeting and we're not meeting it, the tendency for a lot of folks is to, to try to find an excuse for it. Find something to blame it on. So, in this text, the vineyard owner, he's in his vineyard, he's talking to the vineyard worker, and he singles out the one tree that's not doing what it's supposed to do. We can take from this that all the other trees were doing what they were supposed to do. All the other trees in the same ground, in the same orchard, in the same vineyard, are producing fruit, but he singles out this one tree because it's not doing what it's supposed to do, yet it's planted in the same soil as all of the others. But it's not producing. This is what I want to focus on today. Because sometimes in fruitless areas of our life, when we know in our heart that we should be producing something, some sort of spiritual fruit. We've been Christians a long time. We should be fruitful in this area. But we know in our heart we're not. This is what we need to do. This parable is for us. Because if we start to blame or complain about the environment we're in. If we start to complain and blame the ground and, and, and give excuses for why we're not producing fruit. And usually, how many know that there's usually a big difference between the excuse and the reason? Bring. Hello? Yeah. Oh, tell them I'm not here. Uh, she's not here right now. That's the excuse. The reason is, I don't feel like talking. So a lot of times for the things in our life that we know aren't right, we're going to try to assign blame to it. We're going to blame the ground. We're going to blame our, uh, our fruitless condition on things around us. We're going to say, well, I'm not producing fruit because I, I, I didn't have the opportunities that, that this tree had. Uh, I, I didn't have all this. I didn't have the education. We come up with all kinds of excuses. I'm not good enough, or I'm not talented enough, or or this guy makes me let mad. This guy rubs me the wrong way. We come up with reasons why we're not fruitful. But what this parable is telling us is that we need to dig deeper. Because if we look around at the other trees around us, if all of us look around at believers around us we'll find somebody that had it even worse than we did, yet they're producing fruit, spiritually speaking. Maybe they're saved a lot less time than we are, and they're producing fruit. They're in the same soil we are, and we're not. So we look for, we try to find an excuse of why we're not producing. And God doesn't want us to go around comparing ourselves and making excuses for why we're not bearing fruit. God wants us to get to the root of the problem. Amen? 
Because I, one time, was complaining about different things, and I grew up this hard way, and I come up hard, and I saw things in the church as a pastor's son that I shouldn't have had to see, and, and I saw the worst of people in the church, and I make these excuses for why I'm not serving the Lord. Ah, those church people. I grew up in a pastor's home. I had the perfect excuse. Any pastor's kids in here, give me an amen. Y'all know. I made excuses for years when the actual reason is, is I was spiritually lazy. But I made <clears throat> excuses until I started realizing that I was surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ who had it worse than I did, and they found a way to produce fruit. They found a way to turn it around and, and let their life be a testimony of the goodness and the grace of God. We got to stop making excuses. This is step number one in our spiritual growth process. We need to stop making excuses for our fruitless areas. Stop making excuses for why we drink, why we go to the smoke pot, and I need to relax, or why we do this. We need to stop with the excuses. The first rule of growth when we want to get up in the morning and put on our our spiritual big boy pants or big girl pants we got to stop making excuses for the fruitless areas of our life and choose to give it to god and let the vineyard worker go to work on our lives amen because you know what we're people of faith and faith will always see the way, whereas doubt can only see the obstacle. Look what Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul is saying, I'm not going to make excuses. I have learned to grow and produce fruit in every circumstances, no matter what the soil or the environmental conditions is. I have found a way to flourish. Now look what David wrote about our source in Psalm 92, 12 and 13. David said, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. This is the message that you and I as believers in the church as a whole, this is the message that we got to get a hold of, especially in the dry seasons of our life. We need to remember who our source is. We need to realize and remember that who we're rooted in. Amen? Now look at the vineyard owner's response back in Luke 13, 7 and 9. The, the vineyard keeper, there, he's walking around with the vineyard owner. And the vineyard owner's looking at his trees and he says, I've been watching this tree for three years and it's not producing, so cut it down. Get rid of it. Now, the vineyard helper, the vineyard worker steps in and becomes a mediator between the fruitless tree and the vineyard owner. He steps in, he says, wait a minute. Before you cut it down, let me work with it for another year and then see what happens. So the vineyard owner says, okay, I'll make a deal with you. Notice the vineyard owner's response. He says, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to put a deadline on this problem. The vineyard owner didn't say, well, you know, I'll grow up someday. Whenever my life changes, I'll, when I get a better job and, and my life, I'm more happy in my situation, then I'll probably, I'll start producing fruit. We'll see what happens up the road. We'll, we'll worry about my spiritual life way up the road. But God is the vineyard owner. Jesus is our vineyard worker. He's the mediator between us and the Father. 
And Jesus says, let me work with it for a while. And God says, okay, but I'm going to put a deadline on it. I'll give you one year. And if it doesn't produce fruit in a year, cut it down. Because we're wasting ground on a fruitless tree. Man, it's quiet in here. God said he's going to cut it down if it doesn't produce in a year. I'll give you a year. If it doesn't produce, cut it down. What this is saying to us, we as believers sometimes need to put a deadline on the fruitless areas of our life. The whole, you, know, you know the fruitless areas of your life. You don't need anybody telling you because we are rooted as Christians. We've got the Holy Spirit. We're, our roots are in Christ, right? So the Holy Spirit, through conviction or whatever, has revealed to you the fruitless, the spiritual fruitless area of our lives. So we know what they are. But we need to say, okay, God, I'm going to put a deadline on my fruitless area. And I'm going to really get down and I'm going to dig deeper into my Christian life. I'm going to go beneath the surface to the root system to find out why I'm fruitless. And I'm trusting that your Holy Spirit will reveal to me. And every time the Holy Spirit will, we got to say, I'm going to stop, Lord. Today's the day. I'm going to stop with the excuses and I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to dig deeper into this fruitless area of my life. I'm going to stop being passive about it and kicking it forward another six months, eight months, five years, 50 years. And I'm going to say, Lord, today is the day I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to really start going to work on it. I'm going to give it what it deserves and I'm going to let your Holy Spirit work with me and tend to me so I can start producing fruit again in this area. Look what the vineyard keeper said. He said he'd do two things. First, he says, I'll dig around it. He says, all the way around it. All the way around it. In other words, the problem doesn't lie on the surface. On the surface from a distance, it looks like all the other trees. Hey, Christians, they all look alike. We're trees, we all look alike from the surface. But it's what's beneath the surface that, that determines whether or not we produce fruit. Amen? Maybe it's an area of your, of your life that, that you know is fruitless. Maybe God's trying to get you to dig a little deeper into your prayer life. If, if you lack wisdom in the scriptures, if, if you've been coming to church for 10 years and you still don't know what the, the pastor or the teacher is talking about when they read the Old Testament, it's time to dig deeper into God's word. If, if you don't have the joy that you had when you first got saved, then it's time to dig a little deeper into your worship life and into your prayer life. You see what I'm saying? Because it has to lie beneath the surface. That's where God does his best work is beneath the surface. So we got to let him dig all the way around the issue. He's the keeper of the vineyard. And God will help us. Jesus, our mediator, will help us through the Holy Spirit become fruitful in the barren, deserted areas of our life. Conviction's the way God says, hey, something wrong with your roots. Conviction is the way that God says, it's time to dig a little deeper, Rob. You got, you got mad in traffic a lot quicker than you used to. I delivered of you of that anger, that road rage 25 years ago, and here you go again. It's time to dig deeper. I thought, I delivered you from drinking, and yet you're sneaking off to drink a beer or smoke a joint. Or I delivered you from gossip, and you find yourself you know, down at Denny's, huddled with other cackling, People talking about the pastor or whoever. And God says, I thought I delivered you from, from doubt. And you find yourself saying, where are you, God? These are the problems that lie beneath the surface. So we got to know God wants us to become fruitful. We know what the fruit of the Spirit is. We can all name them. Love, joy, peace, peace patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the fruit 
of the Holy Spirit. And if you look at those things and you say, well, I do this okay, but that one not so much, and this one okay, those are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says fruit. So many people take that out of context and say fruits of the Spirit. No, there's the gifts of the Spirit, and then there's the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. As believers, we should have all of those things. All that fruit should be just popping out of our lives in all situations, especially in trials and tribulations. So if, if you look at those fruit of the Spirit and you think, eh, maybe this one, yeah, and that one not so much, then it's time to dig deeper. So if there's no joy in your life, it could be that you've allowed a root of bitterness to grow in and wrap around the good roots. Maybe you're holding on to an offense from 10 years ago. I can't believe how that person done me. Get over it. God clipped that root of, business, or root of bitterness out of your heart years ago. Why do you keep feeding it? Because if you feed it, it'll grow. We learned that from hamsters. Amen? We learned that from, from weeds. If you feed it, it'll grow. So stop feeding your root of bitterness. Stop feeding your addiction. Stop feeding your offense. Stop feeding your unforgiveness. And God will remove that root. So you won't be spiritually root bound. Stop blaming the symptoms. Because when we do that, we lose our focus on what the real problem is. Chances are, if it's happening to you, it's something underneath the surface. Uh, surface. It's time to dig deeper. You know, I love the prayer. <clears throat> Pray the prayer that David prayed. This is what really turned me around. I started opening my word and praying scripture. You ever do that? Praise God. That's when I really started to grow. When I recognized that this is what God wants for me. So I'm going to pray scripture. And I begin to pray the prayer that David prayed. And this is a biggie. If you've got areas in your life and the Holy Spirit right now is bringing thoughts to your mind of, of areas that you've allowed a root of bitterness to grow, pray this prayer. Be brave in the Spirit and pray this prayer in Psalm 139, 23, and 24. David says, search me, O God. He doesn't say, oh search her, oh God. She's the source of my problem. Surf, search him, oh Lord, and reveal how he's messing my life up. Search my boss, oh Lord, and tell him how blessed he is to have me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Spiritually, a lot of times, we get arrogant that way. Well, enough, uh, enough, about, enough about me, Sister Marcy. Let's, let's talk about you. How do you feel about me? <laughs> this is spiritually, it sounds crazy, it makes us laugh, but spiritually, a lot of times in our prayers, this is what we do. I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. But the Bible says when Job prayed for his friends, that's when everything was added back to him. David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. How do how is God going to test us? If you're building something, how do you test it? If you're building a roof that has to support a ton of weight, Doug, how do you test it? You put a ton of weight on it. If it buckles under the pressure, it's not sturdy enough, right? Test me. And how does he test us? Through trials. Trials is the testing, is the laboratory of our faith. God tests us through trials. Sometimes he tests us through blessings. Okay, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you uh, have a, the best job you've ever had. And you're going to be working and making more money than you've ever made. So I'm going to test you with a blessing because I'm going to see how much blessing it takes to pull you away from me. Test me, O Lord, is what David said. And know my anxious thoughts. Point out in me, anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. David is saying, God, 
I want to roll up my sleeves. It's time to do the dirty work in my heart. God, you know my every little dirty little secret. You know my habits. Test me. Search me. Find my anxious thoughts and the things that you don't like about my life. So what we need to pray. Say, God, I'm not going to, I know I'm not fruitful in this area of my life, so search me and tell me what it is. What is it in me that is preventing your fruit, your light from being reflected through my own life? God, I'm going to stop blaming others. I'm ready. I need this. Search me. And you know what? When we do that, and we commit to letting the Holy Spirit dig deeper into us, you're going to grow like you've never grown before. In fact, God may make you fruitful in areas of your life that you thought was dead. Well, I'm too old. I can't do that anymore. Or I've got to, I can't do this, I can't do that for this reason or that reason. God, when he searches you and tests you, may reveal to you that it was all those I can't because, I can't because, I can't because, that has been the root of bitterness that has kept you spiritually root bound. Stop saying, Lord, I can't. And start saying, okay, I can't, but I know you can. So the first thing the vineyard worker said he'd do was dig around it. The second thing he said he would do for the non-fruit producing tree in that vineyard was he would fertilize it. I love the King James Version says, dung it. Y'all know what dung is? Do I need any? any okay, if you, see one of the deacons after church if you don't know what dung is, and they'll explain it to you. The King James Version says, dig it and dung it. Fertilize it. And what is that fertilizer? How many times in our life have we felt like we were up to our neck in fertilizer? <laughs> we felt like we were covered up in a big old steaming pile of fertilizer. But it's that fertilizer that God will pile on our life that will bring the nutrients, and the growth so that we, once again, will start producing better fruit than we've ever produced in our life. So first we dig around it, then we let God fertilize it. Can I get an amen? amen. After we dig around these fruitless areas, God will, will fertilize it to enrich the soil that we're planted in, just like with a fruit tree. When I lived in California, we lived on the coast, and we had orange orchards all around us and citrus. And those of y'all that's lived in Florida may know, but the best fertilizer for orange orchards is chicken poop. And it stinks. And so the, the big steermen, the big double wing airplanes would, would fly over the orchards all around our house about four or five times a year and just spray that stuff everywhere. And the whole town smelt like, chicken do, right? It even started, you could taste it in the, in the town I grew up in, you could taste it in the water. You could, you could taste the water twice. <laughs> Once going down. Oh, never mind. But sometimes it's these messy, dirty, filthy things in our life, these trials and tribulations and self-examinations that God will use to pile on. And it's fertilizer because God is testing and growing. And he, he, we're in the laboratory of the Holy Spirit. And he's bringing nutrients into our life that maybe we're not used to. To make us produce more fruit. And I'll tell you, we got to trust God to just pile on enough fertilizer to help us grow. And if you, as a believer, if you look back through your lives, I'll bet you that some of your greatest spiritual growth periods when you, is when you were covered up in fertilizer. So if you pray this prayer that David prayed, be ready when the Holy Spirit pulls up 
with his truck and start shoveling out the fertilizer and dumping it on your life. Because you got to say, thank you, Lord. Again, read James chapter 1. Thank you, Lord. I consider it a joy to go through this trial. How can that be? Because I know that because of this fertilizer, God is going to begin to bring fruit out of my life like never before. It's that process that will give us a greater capacity in our hearts for intimacy with God. So if there's areas of your character that you can't seem to get under control or a habit or an old thing, I know. I certainly know. Let God shovel on some fertilizer to produce fruit in the areas where you know there should be fruit. Amen? Don't get mad. Don't blame others. Don't, don't say it's because I had a bad childhood or it's because I got hurt by church people or it's because they took me for this and, and it's because of, uh, my mother didn't buy me a sled. Rosebud! Rosebud! That's what we do as Christians. And I'm citing a movie that's like 75 years old. Sorry, Citizen Kane, one of the greatest films ever. We find all of these ways to blame our fruitlessness on and then we sit there. Yeah. Because of them. It's because of that. God says, stop it. Stop it. Search me, O Lord. Don't let the enemy... See, the enemy wants to keep you in a spiritual holding pattern. Holding patterns when a plane flies in and for whatever reason can't land and they circle the airport. They circle the destination. You're not making your destination. It's right down there. You can see it. You can see it all the way around. I've seen the north, south, east, and west of Nashville from a plane going in circles. Satan wants to do this. He wants to, you and I as believers to keep in a holding pattern, going around in circles of dead faith. Knowing that we're on the plane looking down at the destination, knowing that that's where God wants us to be, but not putting foot to faith. And stepping out and saying, okay, God, Take me there. I want to be what you want me to be. The worst thing we can do is can think we're the only ones covered up in fertilizer to think that God's picking on us because we've got more trials than everyone else. We just need to know that God loves us so much that he's taking the time to tend to us patiently and lovingly making us bear fruit to create us into the people that, to make us into the people that he's created us to be. I can see in this parable the patience of the vineyard worker, but I can also see the urgency from the perspective of the vineyard owner. The vineyard owner saying, we can't waste any ground. We can't let anything stay in this vineyard that's not producing fruit. God is telling Christians today, it's time. I need soldiers. I got a bunch of flabbies on the, on the, on the football field. I need warriors out there, Christians. Family, you're my hands and feet and you've crippled me with your entertainment. You've crippled me with your, your inclusive uh, uh, one-size-fits-all religiosity. You've crippled me by denying the power thereof, by knowing and having a form of godliness, but denying what that power of God, the Holy Spirit, can do in our life and in in our church. God says, you need to be producing fruit. Stop making excuses. This is an orchard of fruit trees. I'm going to give you one year. Maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you, man, we've had, we had this conversation five years ago and you're still going around in circles. Stop it. And when we pray what David prayed, search me, O Lord, here comes the fertilizer. God will test you. He will test me. Amen? I think that 
I love Psalm 1, 1 through 4. That's what we're going to read. Because you know what? This is the first thing. Out of all the, I love the Psalms. They're full of beautiful songs and they're beautiful thoughts and beautiful praise. And when the psalmist got down to writing and starting this, what would be an incredible, incredible collection of beautiful songs and thoughts, the first thing that the psalmist wanted to convey, the first thought that he said he wanted to convey to anyone in the future who would read this book, look what they are. Psalms chapter 1, the first three verses. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. In other words, no matter what season you're going through in life, you will bear fruit. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do. If you'd like to support this church, this ministry, you want to honor the Lord with the worship of tithe and offering, you can go to servantsheartworshipcenter.com. You can do it online. You can click the donate tab at the top of the home page. Then go down and click the yellow donate button. Type in the amount you want to donate. Then either click the PayPal and use your PayPal account or the debit and credit card button and follow the instructions from there. Or if you'd like to send in a check, you could send uh, your tithe and, and offering to Servants Heart Worship Center at P.O. Box 1859, Spring Hill, Tennessee, 37174. I love you all so much. God bless you.